Decision for Life. Welcome to First Baptist Church Indian Trail. Take your Bible, if you will, look with me to Matthew chapter number 5, and uh, just kind of hold your spot there for a few minutes. <clears throat> I don't know, about a year ago, year and a half, something like that, um, I, I got called to this church up in the mountains to preach one night, and uh, said, Pastor, now you, you got to wear a suit, and uh, you got to preach out of the King James Bible. And so I got a, a layman to go with me and drive. It was about, uh, about a three-hour drive there. And uh, I, I get up there to the church. I'm the only one. There's only about 20 people there. And I'm the only one that had a suit on. And I think I'm the only one that had a Bible. But we had have, we have dinner be, beforehand. And the first thing out of the pastor's mouth after we said hello, the first thing before we ever even uh, ordered our uh, iced tea, the first thing he said was, uh, how do you know when it's the right time to leave a church? Now, I probably don't have a question asked of me from pastors any more than that question. When do you know that it's right? So what he's communicating, he's communicating a couple of things. He's saying, first of all, um, I, I'm having a push from where I am. There's just something about where I am that uh, is not comfortable anymore. And then he's, then he's got this huge, um, th this huge thought process going on that there's got to be something better than what I'm experiencing where I am. H have you ever felt that way? Maybe on this first Sunday in, um, in 2020, maybe that's part of your process as well. Maybe that's part of your thinking. You, you, you're really not happy with the way things are where you are right now. Maybe it's your job, maybe it's some other situation, but you know that God's got something better for you than what you had in 2019. There's got to be something greater. There's just something unsettling in, in your heart and in your mind. Maybe you're going through that uh, with some kind of relationship. Maybe it's in your family. Let, let me go a little deeper with you than that. Maybe you have that feeling and that unsettling with God. Maybe you're just not happy with the way you, you, your relationship with God's going right now. And you know, deep down in your heart, you know God's got something better than what you're experiencing now. So, so maybe that's where it is. Um, so let, let's look at the text for a minute and just see what the word may have to speak to us. Matthew chapter 5 and pick it up in verse 16. <coughs> let your light so shine before men. Go, wait a minute, go back to verse 13. Go back to verse 13. You, you're the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost its savour, wherewith shall ye be salted? It's thenceforth, good for, it, it's good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden underfoot of men. You're the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill uh, can't be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it in a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Now, there are two dynamic images that arise right out of this text that, that man, are just <laughs> unmistakable. You can't get over it. You see, the first one is salt. And then the second image that rises up out of that passage is light. Now, um, the, the, the thing that I want you to draw attention to you, first of all, is what he says, you are the salt. You are the light. He didn't say you might be, you could be, you ought to be. He says you are. Now the reason that he says that is that because there was no refrigeration possible in those days. And so the way to stop the decay of the meat was to put the preservative of the salt and apply it. Now you can have the salt, but the salt's got to be applied to that. Now I just got back from uh, 
uh, Phoenix, when Kathy and I went out on Christmas Day, uh, carried my vertigo with me, and uh, we went out to Phoenix to visit with my family and see my grandkids. And, and my grandkids, they, they, they always call, and before I leave, they say, Papa, you going to bring us any kraut? You going to bring us any sauerkraut? Because they, they love it. So I said, now, why don't, why don't I teach them how to make it? Instead of carry it to him all the time. So we went and got some cabbage and I bought a little chopper and we chopped up the cabbage. And my little 16 year old granddaughter, she was right in there with me and, and she was, I was letting her do that. And so we chopped up the cabbage and we put them in pint jars. And I couldn't believe it, but Phoenix even had the pickling salt that we needed for it. And uh, so we got the pickling salt and I, I said, Now you got to put the exact amount in there. If you don't, it, it, won't, it won't be right. Uh, if you put too little, then the cabbage will rot. If you put too much, uh, then it's going to be so sour that nobody would want to eat it. So you got to put just the right amount. Now, I said, now, Kaylee, uh, in about 10 days, uh, you can go open that crowd up and you can enjoy it. And I said, now, one of the things that you can't do is, though, you can't go in and pull the salt out from the cabbage anymore, but you can sense its effectiveness. Now, that's exactly what uh, the Lord Jesus is talking about right here in this passage. Salt isn't to be seen, but it's to be sensed. Its effects are unmistakable. How many of you in here love salt? I, I, I'm telling you now, every time I go to the, the doctor, he or she will say, now, salt is not your friend. I hear it all the time. You know what I tell them? I say, doc, I put salt on my salt. I, I love salt. And, and, and if you study the scriptures, the, in, in the Gospel of Luke, he tells us that salt is good. Now, now, so I just, you argue with the Bible, doctor. Don't argue uh, with me. But, but now here, here's the deal. Jesus says that you are to be the salt in the world that is around you. People may not be able to see him, but they ought to be able to sense him when they are around you. And then he uses this next image is that you are the light of the world. Now the light's a whole lot different than salt. Uh, salt is sensed, it's not seen. Light is very visible. It shows up and it dispels uh, the darkness. And, and so people need to not only look at you and see Jesus in you, they ought to be able to sense Jesus in you. Why is that? Well, look at the latter part of verse 16. There are eight words that are in there that tell you why. So that, you're, that you glorify your Father which is in heaven. Huh. Would you agree with me that the leadership here at First Baptist push you real hard to invite people to come to church when you come? Would you agree that we, we, we say to you, bring somebody with you, invite somebody, have a guest with you when you come? And we, we've done that for years. Can I get a witness from people in the church? Let, let, me, let me just say a word to you. If we would be the salt and if we would be the light that the Lord Jesus is exposing to us that we ought to be, we wouldn't have to be inviting people to come with us. Why? Because they would sense something about us and they would see something in us that they would desire more than anything else. They would say, hey man, what you got? I want what you got. Where do you go? How did you get that? Uh, what are you reading right now? What, what you smoking right now? I want what you got. And they would invite themselves to come with you. You wouldn't have to be inviting them. So Jesus says that there ought to be a sense about us of him. There ought to be something seen in us that is him and not us. And so he's laying down this push-pull principle. I said to that young pastor, I said to him, there are always two things at work when God's getting ready to move you as a preacher. 
There is a push from where you are. There's an uncomfortableness about. There's an unsettling that goes on in your life. And then there is a draw towards something else. And so you have that push-pull principle. And, and that's exactly what arises out of the text today. Jesus is giving us that push-pull principle. Now, here's your assignment for next Sunday. This is a two-part sermon that I'm preaching, not to Christians and not to non-Christians, but to people. There, there are six times in the remaining part of chapter number five, these words, but I say unto you, now, that, that may not make you shout hallelujah and glory to God and, and throw babies out of the balcony. But, 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 but there's something very powerful uh, about those words. But I say unto you, he says, you've heard all of this stuff before. Watch this in verse 21. You, you've heard this stuff all before. You, 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 you've been acquainted with this. You, you have known this for a very long time that it was said by them of old time. Don't kill don't murder. And, and whoever kills shall be in danger of the judgment. Now here's the first time that he uses the word. But I say unto you that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. Now Jesus said, now you've heard this all your life that you ought not to take another person's life. We all know that that's a bad thing. We all know that. And, and there's none of us in this room that would... Uh, even consider doing that in our life. But the fact of the matter is, uh, I've had three funerals in the last six months of victims of murder. And it's a bad thing. We know that it's a bad thing. And Jesus says, you've heard that it's been a bad thing for a long, long time. But I say unto you that if you have anger or ought against your brother, then, then it's the same thing. It, it, you're in danger of the... So what Jesus does is that he drills down a little bit deeper. He casts a wider net. He's not talking necessarily here about killing a person physically, but he is talking about wounded relationships. Wounding somebody in your family. Wounding somebody that you work with. Wounding a friend along the way. He's talking very seriously about that. Maybe even hurting ourselves. And what Jesus is saying, hey, you've heard this all of your life and you know the results of that and you know the pain of that, but I am calling you to something different. You've got the push, but I'm bringing you now the pull. I, I want to call you to something different. Now, going down verse 27, and he said, you have heard that it was said of them of old time, thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, and there's that assignment now, I want you to be reading because next week we're going to be talking more about this. But I say unto you, hmm, uh, thou, that whosoever looks on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. And if your right eye offend you, pluck it out and cast it from you. For it's profitable for you that one of my members should perish and not that my whole body should be cast into hell. And if your right hand offend you, cut it off. Powerful statements and powerful words. He said, you've heard all your life, don't commit adultery. Thank God. Now, watch this, watch this. Now, some of you are fixing to have a cardiac arrest in the next two minutes. I want you to see what he didn't say. <laughs> he didn't say you ought not to have sex. Can I get a hallelujah and a glory to God and an amen that he didn't put that in the scriptures. And the fact of the matter is, um, Bob Fornication didn't invent it 200 years ago or 500 years ago or five centuries ago. God invented sex. God created sex. And he said that it was a good thing within the context and the confines of marriage. But then when you get outside the confines and the context of marriage, he says it's a destroyer. Uh, and, and, he, and he really blows it up. I'm telling you, uh, it's amazing how he 
really magnifies this thing. I've, I've watched this in church so often and seen it so many times. Jesus said, don't commit adultery. And, and if necessary, gouge out your eyes. Was he literally talking about physically plucking out your eyes? No, no. If that were true, every man in here would be blind as a bat. That, that's not what he's talking about. He's not saying, is he saying, destroy your body, mutilate your body? No. Is he saying, go down to Hooters because they have the best wings in town? No. That's not what he's saying. But what he is saying is, says, guard your heart at all cost. Protect your eyes, which is the, really the eye gate to the soul, if you will. And, and what, what the Lord's do, doing right here is he's drilling down to where you and I live. Can I get an amen from somebody? He, he's really going to the point here uh, of where we exist. And, and he's saying, whatever you have to do, take drastic measures to keep from committing this sin. I, I, I could line up hundreds of people who have been affected deeply by the sin of adultery, which has fractured their families. Lust and fantasy and pornography have destroyed relationship after relationship after relationship. Jesus says, I'm calling you to something different. You've heard what everybody else has said. You've heard what everybody else has commended. You've heard what everybody else has propagated. But I am saying to you, there is something different. Why? He knows because there is a better way to live. Ladies and gentlemen, Jesus didn't come down here just to knock the dents out of our lives and to straighten us out. He came down here to transform us and to make us new and to give us a fresh start and a new beginning. And he says, follow me. Here's the problem. We blow into 2020 and most of us in the room are just satisfied with the status quo. Uh, we, we are just satisfied with the way that things are going. And when you get satisfied with the status quo, here's what happens. You miss out on the transformational power of God. And you miss out on, but I say unto you. Come in week after week like a bunch of robots. And we sit in the same seat that we always sit in week after week. And we go through the same motions week after week. We go to the life groups week after week. We give of our offering week after week. And, and, and we say, well, okay, we've done that. And we go get in our cars and we drive home. And it's just the status quo. But Jesus says, I don't want you to be like, like, like on a treadmill. I, I, I don't want you to be in the rat race I want you to follow me with passion. I, I, I want you to go in the direction that I want you to go into. Why? Because the fact of the matter is the way Christ leads us leads us to a life. Um, I wonder how many of you in here this morning on this first Sunday of 2020, you, you'd, you'd say to me, Pastor, I want something different in my life. Um, I, I'm really not happy with the way that things are going in my life. And, and I'm not really sure that my life is counting for anything. And, and if I could have one really great answer to prayer in my life today, it would be, I want my life to matter. I want it to count for something. Well, if that's true in your life, then quit settling for the status Quo, that's the push part. Quit settling for the way things have been. Now, here's the good news. You ready for this? Uh, you can be transformed by the power of God. You, you can have a life that matters. You can have a life that makes a difference. But you can't do it in your own energy. 
and you can't do it in your own strength. You can't do it in your own wisdom. You can't do it in your own ingenuity. It's only the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit of God living in you and through you that will make the difference. Now I want to ask you a couple of questions and then we'll close. The first question is this. Is there a pull in you? Well, maybe push is a better word. Is there a push in you for something different than what you're experiencing? Now, I'll quickly say this. Age doesn't matter. There's some 10-year-olds in here and there's some 80-year-olds in here. I want to say to you, it doesn't matter how old that you are. It doesn't matter at what level of spirituality that you are right now on either. So age and spiritual maturity doesn't matter. Do you have this push in you that says, I don't want my life to be the same as it's been. I want something different. I, I have an unsettling in me that my life is not counting as much as it ought to count and it's not mattering as much as it ought to matter and I want something greater than what I am experiencing. Now, let me say to you, um, if you don't have that push, I'm okay with that. I, I get that, all right? I get that. I, I, the other night, and it's, it's been a few weeks ago, uh, maybe a few months ago, uh, it was after dark and my, my doorbell rang, which is very out of the ordinary. And one of the sweetest couples in the church, I, I've known them for 36 years, and, and they, they were at my door and uh, they, had, they had huge smiles on their face, about that big. And I went to the door and, and they, they brought in, and I could smell it before I saw it, they brought in this big box that came from Cineholic over here at Sun Valley. Can I get a witness from anybody in the house? And they were just, I mean, beaming from ear to ear. And I opened up that box and there was, you know, that Cinnabon kind of stuff. And boy, they had just poured that hot, gooey, whatever that is, on there. Oh, my word. And so if you don't have that push in that, I get it because you kind of just nestled down in the middle of all of that gooey, warm, amazing stuff in the Cineholic and you just want to stay there for the rest of your life. <laughs> I, I get it. I, I understand it. Uh, but if in your gut, in your gut, there's something gnawing that says, I want something greater for my faith and I want something greater for my future. Hey, by the way, before I go any further in this message, and you've got that desire and you're ready to take the steps to get to where God wants you to be, I'm going to tell you up front, it's not an easy thing. It's difficult. It's spiritual warfare. I, I can tell you biblically it's, it's not. The Bible says broad is the way that leads to destruction and a whole bunch of people find themselves in the middle of that broad way. But Jesus said narrow is the way that leads into life eternal, that leads into where I want you to be and very few people ever find it. Jesus himself even said, my way is hard, my way is difficult. So I'm just going to tell you, you may have that gnawing in you that says, I want something better for my faith, I want something better for my future. Once you make that decision that you're going to do something about it, it won't be easy. It'll be difficult. Second question. If you're listening, shake your head like that. Second question. Am I willing to lay down my agenda and pick up his? 
Tough question. Am I willing to forfeit my plans and I'm willing to take on his plans? By the way, let me, let me just, when Jesus looks at what he has for you and, and, and he, he looks at what you think you have for you, I, I suspect he laughs out loud. <laughs> I, I really do. But if you're going to be who he wants you to be, and if you, you really want to satisfy that gnawing, that unsettling, and that complacency, you've got to be willing to come to the place that you say, God, I'm no longer what I want for my life. I want what you want from my life. And here's what I found out. There are a lot of people that say, you know what, I, I really like where I am. I really like what's going on in my life. Well, I'm, I'm living in a dream world. You, know, you ask people, how are you doing? Well, I'm just living the dream. You, you know what I found out mostly about that? The motivation behind that agenda and that plan is selfishness. Just selfishness. And we all know where that leads. Now, here's, here's, what I, here's what I want to encourage you with. You ready for this? This is worth the price of admission today. Once, once you get to the place that you're willing to lay down your plans and you're willing to say, God, you know, that, that really hasn't brought me where I want to be. And, and I want to, in 2020, I, I want to be who you want me to be. And I want your agenda to be my agenda. You have a wonderful promise out of the book of Matthew where the word says, seek ye first the kingdom of God. In other words, don't put your plans first, put my plans first. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. God, I want to be who you want me to be. The word simply says that from that moment on, he will supply every day-to-day -day need that you have in your life. That's his promise just for you. So tomorrow when you wake up, and you look into a mirror, and I'm not saying that physical mirror, but you look into that mirror and you say, whose agenda am I going to live today? Am I going to serve God and others, or am I going to serve myself? Guess who wins? Maybe you look into that mirror, and, and, and the Holy Spirit says, I want you to forgive and I want you to let go and I want you to put aside all of those feelings that you've been harboring of resentment against somebody else and I want you to forgive that person and your flesh rises up and says, not today, I'm going to seek revenge for what they did to me. Guess who wins? Holy Spirit says, today I want you to be generous and and I want you to hold very loosely those things that I have entrusted to you along the way. And yet your flesh says, I work hard for what comes my way. And you're very materialistically minded. And you're going to say, I'm going to hold on to that stuff. Guess who wins? As a pastor, most of the pain and the heartache that I've seen from people here, almost always point back to the people who chose their own way. Look with me to Matthew 7 and verse 24. Here's the bottom line. Matthew 7 verse 24. Therefore, whosoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I'll liken him to a wise man who built his house on a rock and the rain descended and floods came, the winds blew, beat on the house and it didn't fall and it didn't crumble because it was built on a solid foundation. But to those people who hear me and the sayings of mine and they don't do them, well, they're like a foolish person who built their house on the sand the rain came, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on the house, and it crumbled, and great was the fall of it. So the choice is this. 
You either obey or you ignore. <laughs> you either say, okay, God, I want to be salt and I want to be light. I want people to sense when they are around me that there is something different about me. And I, and I want them to be able to see that that difference is Jesus by the things that I do. You're the difference. Or you say, you know what, I'm pretty content with where I am. Pretty satisfied with where life has taken me. And you ignore the salt and the light. We either build our life on the teachings and the precepts and the principles of God's word. And we're like that old boy that built his house on that solid rock foundation. Or we ignore the teachings of the word of God. And we wind up when the wind blows, our lives crumble. So the decision is yours. Invitation is going to be a little different here now in these next few minutes. Um, I, I'm going to speak into the life of every one of you that came here today. And, and you know that there's, there's just something missing. There's a void in your life. You, 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 you're not happy, you're not content with where you are right now in your walk with God. And you know that God's got something better for you than what you have been experiencing. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to just as an act of faith, I want you to get up out of your seat and I want you to come and just stand right here at the front and let me pray with you and over you. Because here's the deal. Are you ready for this one? I'm right there with you. I'm right there with you. I, I sat yesterday uh, and, and, and went through a prayer journal. I, I'm reinventing my prayer life because I wasn't happy with my prayer life. I, I'm, I'm doing some things differently in Bible study than I've done in years. You know why? Because I really wasn't real happy with the time and the direction in the Word of God. And so I, I, I'm right there with you. I want to be salt. And I want to be light. And I suspect there's a whole lot of people here today that want to do the same thing. I'm really not happy. There's something unsettling. There's something complacent about me. And, and I have this huge pull that God has something better in store for my life. And so today I'm willing to lay down my agenda and my plans and God, I want your plans. I want your agenda in 2020. After the prayer, I'm going to ask all of us to stand. And after the prayer, when you stand in one motion, those of you that have that unsettling and you want God's best, I want you to come and just stand right here in the front. Father, thank you for this people. Thank you for that you've brought us here this morning. I pray in the invitation right now that you would be glorified, that you would be praised, that lives would be changed by your transformation. In Jesus' name I pray, and for his sake, amen. Thank you for watching Decision for Life. Our location, life group, and program information are available online at fbcit.org. We hope you will take the opportunity to join us in person. Thank you from the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail.